my earliest work after my PhD was on the fur trade, Denny hunting and the fur trade. So I did a couple of pieces on music and then the Denny asked me if I would give testimony at the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline hearings. And they assigned me a topic which they called past and present land use of the Denny. That was the topic. I was given that topic. That's the title of my testimony. I actually saw it as a way of looking at how to explain to a larger public, non-Indigenous public, how it was possible that Indigenous peoples could be successful in prosecuting us there an economy that stood outside of capitalism in the middle of the 20th century late middle of the 20th century today this is not an issue in the least because it's been accepted but at the time that people like Harvey and I did this kind of work it was generally assumed that the Indians were living a very primitive kind of way of life. And in one version, which was uh, led by my former supervisor, Robert Murphy, in his article with Julian Stewart called Tappers and Trappers, that indigenous peoples voluntarily abandoned their ways, their ways of making a living, because they were confronted by superior technology and superior goods, and they wanted them. And the only way that they could get them was by participating in the capitalist economy. And on the other side were the Marxists like Eric Wolf who argued that the capitalist economy was so much more powerful, it disciplined indigenous peoples into joining it in a subordinated position. But in either case, the consequence was that the traditionally, whatever that economy was, was falling apart as either self-destruction or destroyed by capitalism. But the key thing was that it was falling apart. So the building of this pipeline was then argued to be a good thing because unlike in other places where this march of capitalism had led to the marginalization of indigenous peoples, the pipeline was going to offer jobs that maybe last 10 years or so, but would give them the transition into the wage economy. And when I got to the University of Alberta, I was shanghaied into a committee that was going to help these people do this. Of course, I objected, but anyway, it was. Um, so my testimony was really writing against that. And it wasn't theory, because when we lived in Wrigley, it was absolutely clear that people were relying an awful lot on hunting. And somewhat on trapping, but an awful lot on hunting. Caribou, moose would come into town all the time. There'd be fish, game, little small game, all the time. So the ideological side of the argument was the side of the argument that said this economy was falling apart. The, the reality-based side said it wasn't. So what was it in the theory that needed to be adjusted so that 
this truth could be explained. And that was, I decided for myself, that was this articulation of modes of production argument. So what we, what I did was, I, since it was, the testimony is called Past and Present Land Use, I went through the whole history of the fur trade in the, that region, the slavey region, um, to the present. And I showed, and here I followed the work of June Helm and some other really first-class researchers, that the fur trade did not create major changes in the way in which the Dene lived their lives. They, they still used the, the kind of kinship and marriage system that I was talking about. They organized their labor based on family members working together. They shared their resources. They, what, and they produced an awful lot of food uh, out of it. In fact, I did some statistical analysis showing that in the 19, late 1960s, early 1970s, they um, they uh, were producing as much from the from the uh, from uh, food production. It would replace more than replace the protein that we were getting from store food. So it was a pretty big sector of their economy. And I traced out that. The capitalist economy, as long as it was under the fur trade, the capitalist economy being of the mercantile kind, and the way it was done in the north, didn't require the Dene to change the way in which they organized their labor. Because all they had to do was bring their furs into the trading post, and at that point they, they joined the capitalist economy to, to get what they wanted. But then they'd leave and they'd go back into their own ways. And it wasn't until the end of World War II with the collapse of, uh, of fur prices that, they, that that economy started to get into serious difficulty. And the government tried to then change them by giving them Western education, moving them into town, hopefully finding them different kinds of jobs. But right through the period that I was there, they were still living in both economies, and the I think the dominant one, the hegemonic one, was still the Bush economy. So that's what I wrote in my testimony. And the Justice Berger, who made the ruling, agreed with not only me, but there were other people like Peter Usher who made this kind of argument, and said that the future for the North really was to create ways to um, increase the value of what was being produced in the bush by processing in the north or stuff like that. And then once that economy was in place, they could start thinking about building a pipeline because then people would have a choice as to what kind of jobs they might want. So that was that. Was that. Um, and mainly the theoretical contribution was that until, I guess the, one of them was, as long as people could live their ways, way of life within that bush mode of production, they were able to hold the capitalist relations as a minor aspect of the life, not really central to the reproduction of their lives, their ideology or anything else. They were still living in that in that other world. And it was that tipping over where all of a sudden everything is wage labor and that, that might create more problems. I guess that's what I was really worried about and how to solve that. Okay, that's that one. Wildlife. Um... So this was a paper, this was a really a tongue-in-cheek paper. 
Um, but with a very sharp point to it. So I, I'm watching these negotiations on uh, uh, for different aspects of the so-called land claim. And one of them are these provisions on hunting, wildlife provisions, you know, and species and how and who's going to get to determine how much you can hunt and and so on right and um, and I said basically he said I don't care whether this violates everything to do with what makes sense in anthropology because culturally it doesn't make sense at all why don't I say the problem is that the Dene are having, because they keep on complaining that no one should be interfering with their right to hunt, right? And shouldn't be a board to oversee it. Why is there a board to oversee it? Because it's wildlife. Why is it? because it's wildlife, because wildlife is assumed to be a common property resource that's not owned by anyone that the Crown regulates. And so they start the negotiation saying, we're talking about wildlife. But isn't wildlife a culturally determined category? So, for example, so then I make this, I suppose, crazy analogy, but I think it makes sense in terms of an argument. I said, so for the Dene, who hardly ever see a cow, cow is wildlife. It's exotic, it's out there, it has nothing to do with their lives. That's wildlife. Moose is more like an animal they own, it's, the, it's a domestic animal. They know everything about it, they deal with it, they treat it in many ways the way in which we treat domesticated animals. So why don't we just stop all this negotiation about wildlife, say that all of these animals are owned by the Denny in the same way that we own cows, and then they're not subject to your regulations, period, because they're private property that and it logically makes sense because culturally speaking those animals are way closer to domesticated animals from their perspective than they are wildlife so that was my <laughs> that was a pretty good argument <laughs> no way <laughs> Yeah, it didn't, it didn't win anything, but anyway, got published. People talk about it. <laughs> yeah, I should go back to that um, the fur trade. I'm going to go back to that fur trade one just for one more second. Um, so in 2000, Solins came out with a really interesting article. Is this anthropological enlightenment? I don't know if you saw it. Yeah, something. Uh, yeah, you're, you're, yeah. Anyway, you, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and I, I congratulated him in some some ways because like everyone's writing in the other direction. But you know what? He's wrong in the, that in that the Inuit and the Dene, the northern people have not triumphed over capitalism the way in which he says, look, they've shaped capitalism to their needs. In fact, it's a damn struggle all the time, is what it is. And really, the, the wonderful thing out of what we're finding out is that people like Dene, and I'm going to say Inuit too, I mean, because it's clear. So... Foucault, and I know he doesn't, it doesn't originate with him, and you guys would know better than me who it originates with. This is, makes a distinction in English between liberation and freedom. Are you aware of this distinction? Right. Well, 
he says, liberation is the struggle against domination. Okay? But it's always put in terms of the domination. It's always a counter discourse. It's kind of the um, Hegelian master-slave, right? It's always the, the counter discourse, right? And so that part of my argument was that. You see, this wildlife is argument is kind of part of this counter dis discourse. But then there's, a, sorry, then there's another level to it, which Solon's is trying to get to, but it, he, he needed both to really make it work, which is, it's a practice of freedom. And a practice of freedom is the ability to move in this world independently of what capitalism or the state society is creating. So in one dimension, for example, demonstrations against pipelines is liberation. But you're still living in that world where there are those pipelines. What hunting enables these people to do is practice a whole other mode of living which doesn't have to have reference to capitalism. And that's what's so important about hunting. Yeah, so that I wanted to. The great passion for me and what everything we've been talking about is all about is attempting to find a way for settlers, which is the term I use for ourselves, to find ourselves at home in this territory. Now, there's a whole bunch of abstract analytical things that get in the way of that, because for most people, it really doesn't matter. We're here, and it's just fine, we're here and let's just get on with it. And I do understand that. And I do think that people can get way too hung up on um, the theoretical stuff. Maybe not. Maybe you can't get too hung up on the theoretical stuff. Because the the question that we have to face, all of us, Quebec as well as Canada, is what's the basis for our legitimate right, not you and me as individuals, so that's, that's also an issue, but as political societies to come to this place and claim the right to control governance of this place. So, everything that I have done, at least since I wrote Home and Native Land, which is a book I wrote in 1984, um, and it was in the middle of this period when I was working with the Dene, and I started to realize that the basic problem that is with us and not with indigenous people. Since then, I have been grappling with that issue. That is really my activist, anthropological, theoretical, whatever you want to say, my reason for being a scholar is particularly to try to help figure out the answer to this question. Now, this is a question that's been answered many, many times. And I would say, for most honest people, not very well. But it starts with 
the idea <coughs> that somehow, okay, it could be happened too long ago, could be those people really weren't living here. Those people acted like jerks anyway before we came. Um, could be a number of reasons. The question is not a valid one to ask. So let's just get on with it. And in some sense, there is no answer to that question. If you don't really see that there's a problem, no matter how absurd the argument is that's made to show you that there is a problem. Like, for example, they were too primitive. No, they weren't. I can show you they weren't. Like, it's too late. Oh, really? Um, you know, like uh, when Germany conquered France, was that already too late? Like, when is too late? Are you going to count it in a number of years? And, you know, like, anyway, you know, you can go on and on and on. You go centuries, and people get liberated after that time, and we congratulate them for it. So it can't be that. So, I mean, if, you, if you're going to end up with, an, you know, saying, I don't care, then I can't really reason with you. But most people aren't like that. So once you show them that maybe it's a very serious problem, and I would say that the career, my career, and the career of scholars who deal with indigenous issues of my generation who have a political <coughs> orientation in mind. So not many anthropologists many political theorists, many legal theorists, all of us historians have spent an awful lot of time showing ourselves how awful we have been. Right. And so there's a lot of people out there who are beginning to get an understanding of that, and that's a good thing. So the first part of my anthropology since this moment of conversion was to participate in that particular form of truth-telling, I'd say. And as I said earlier, I never claimed to be a legal theorist or a political theorist, maybe, but I think that political theory and anthropological theory are very close on these issues, so that's not so... That's, that's not so much of an issue, but but not a lawyer, not a legal... Anyway, I felt that the point at which, as an anthropologist, we could really make a contribution was to take these stories that political science, and I'm going to kind of use this language that I feel like it's, it's kind of a, an analogy to indigenous backwards, because it's it, it, it going the other way. Um, these stories, which I'm calling charter myths, like the story of Hobbes, which explains why you need to have some sovereign come in right at the beginning and make rules. These things, and history, these things the other disciplines teach as truth. They teach as truth. It's the canon. If you've taken political philosophy, you've learned the canon as the canon. It may be critiqued, but the critique is about the logic of the arguments or something, you know, and this is why I did it better and so on and so forth. They don't do what anthropologists do when we presume ourselves on other societies and say, I can take a step back and look at these things from an analytical perspective and see what job they're doing and where their logic, how are they shaping the culture? So I chose to figure out how these stories. And so the story I spent an awful lot of time on was called, I call the story of Terra Nullius. And I wrote a paper in 
on that where I have a really good friend named Ted Chamberlain who wrote a book called If This Is Your Land, Where Are Your Stories? And he took that from a Gixan person who was arguing against the government official that they had no claim to sovereignty because they didn't have any stories about the land. And I challenged him. And I said, but we do have a story. And here's the story. We showed up. There were these almost human-like creatures that were in this place, but they were really kind of too primitive to have any political system. And we came, and the land was therefore empty, and so we occupied it. So that's why we have a right to be here. That's our story. That's our story. Like, and so I'm treating this like it was an analysis of, uh, of an indigenous culture and their origin stories and so on. That's our origin story. It's short, it's jerky, but it's the story. And we rely on it. So I spent 20 years going through aspects of this story and how it impacts on the way the courts make decisions and why the courts, because the courts are like elders. Their, their decisions are determinative of how we act. So. How do they read these stories? What do they do with them? And so on. And that second book, which was an edited book called Aboriginal and Treaty Rights in Canada, really talked about the limitations of those kinds of arguments and alternatives to those kinds of arguments. Okay? So. About, and along the way, I did things like I served as the advisor for anthropology for the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, which I tried to make these kinds of arguments to the commissioner. So I, I tried in different kinds of ways. 